Looking at the message, true fellowship and unity in God's family. True fellowship. That means there's false fellowship. Fake fellowship. Counterfeit fellowship. Unscriptural fellowship. Unacceptable fellowship. There is a kind of fellowship that God does not approve of. But he says there is true fellowship. As you look at Acts of the Apostles chapter 2. And I'm reading from verse 41. Then they that gladly received his word were baptized. They that gladly received his word. Isn't that the basis of fellowship? Are we not uniting and fellowshipping, worshipping around some definite thing? That is the word. When we hear the word, the word of repentance. And the word of justification through Christ. The word of salvation. And we give our lives to the Lord. We're born again. Those people who have become born again. Those are the people that are called into fellowship. Because it must not be a fellowship between the dead and the living. Between the sinner and the sin. Between the unbeliever and the unbeliever. Between the idol worshiper and the worshiper of the true living God. It must be the fellowship of like-minded people. The people that have faith in Christ. They are born again. They gladly received the word. And they were baptized. The very first thing they saw. That they ought to give allegiance to and the obedience to. They were baptized in water. And it says that same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. Now we are not told how many are women. How many of them were men but were united and in fellowship. We are not told how many of them were young people. Obviously, you know, whenever there is any gathering like a gathering here, there must be adults, there must be young people, there must be teenagers, but all of them, none of them said, now we're not ready for water baptism. If the church is ready, go ahead. But you see, when they received the word of God, it says they were all baptized 3,000 of them. And then in verse 42, and they, what did they do? They continued. How did they continue? Steadfastly. They continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship. It is not fellowship without doctrine. And that's what you'll find. That's what people are calling us to nowadays. They say, come into fellowship. Are you not Pentecostals? The other Pentecostal churches and gatherings come into fellowship. Are you not charismatics? Don't you believe in the Holy Ghost and in the power, the charisma, the gifts of the Spirit? Let's come together. Doctrine and fellowship. Not fellowship without doctrine. Oh, they say doctrine divides. No. Doctrine does not divide. Those who believe the whole Bible. Doctrine does not divide. Those who believe what Christ has presented. If you continue in my word, then are you my disciples indeed. They say if you're going to have fellowship together, if you're going to unite together, forget the doctrine. I'm telling you, there's no way to do that. You forget the word, you forget Christ. How can we leave Christ apart? Is fellowship so dear? Is peace so dear? Is unity so dear? We must exalt fellowship above Christ. Reject Christ, reject his word, so as to come into fellowship. No, it says, and they, the 3,000, 
continued steadfastly in the apostles doctrine and fellowship and then it says in the breaking of bread and in prayers fellowship we're going to have it and then it talks about another thing after the fellowship look at verse 44 in verse 44 and all that believed how many of them how many of them? The number. 3,120. You know, there were already 120 people. And now we have 3,000 added unto them. 3,120. And it says, And all that believed were what? Together. Together. They were united together. And then it says, And they had all things common. That's what we are talking about tonight. What I want you to understand is a fellowship of like-minded people and the unity of people that rejoice in the word, delight in the word, believe the word. The Lord is not calling us into a fellowship of the dead or the sinners or the unbelievers or the people that do not know the Lord and say, let's all come together. That's a union. Labor union, Christian union, church union. We're talking about the unity of those who are in Christ. In Psalm 94, I'm looking at verse 20. Psalm 94, verse 20. Shall the throne of iniquity have fellowship with thee, which framest mischief by a lie? The answer is no. Fellowship is not that yeah, so precious that we must just gather everybody together. Those on the right, the left hand side people, the right hand side people, those who believe and those who do not believe. No. Fellowship of like minded people continuing in the truth of the word of God and then them fellowship together. Second Corinthians chapter 6. And we're reading from verse 14, 2 Corinthians 6, verse 14. Be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. And you know, sometimes when you read that, we limit you to marriage and we say believers must not marry unbelievers. That's right, that's right. At the same time, you find those same preachers, those same pastors that read that and say that believers must not have fellowship, unity or yoke with the unbelievers, you find those same pastors uniting with the people that do not believe the Bible. Those religious people. The people that do not have faith in Christ as the only Savior. And yet they unite together, and then the next Sunday they can come and say, be not unequally yoked together with some believers, and say, sir, preacher, pastor, you are yoked with some believers too in ministry. Well, the people that do not know that Jesus Christ is the only Savior. Maybe they say it's Christ and Mary, Christ and St. Peter, Christ and rituals, Christ and ceremony, Christ and this other thing. But... This applies to everyone. Be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. Then it says, for what fellowship has righteousness with unrighteousness? Any fellowship? Tell me out loud. And you know, there are times that some of the other people on the other side, they'll tell us directly, those of us who are pastors, or they'll say, oh, thank God you came to our Pastors union, pastors fellowship, pastors fraternity. And you know, it's good you came. We've we'll been looking at you on that side, in that place, far away. Now you have come. But we just want to tell you that here in our union, in our fraternity, we know what you believe. You believe holiness, that's your stuff. We don't accept. If we give you our pulpit, I will tell you in this union, in this fraternity, to speak, please. Avoid the word sanctification. Avoid the word holiness. Avoid purity. That will divide us. We don't 
believe it. What am I doing there? What are you doing there? What fellowship has righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion has light with darkness? And what concord has Christ with Belial? Or what patch has seen that believeth with infidels? What agreement has the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God. Amen. As God has said, I will dwell in them and walk in them. I will be their God and they shall be my people. Wherefore, do what? Again? Come out from among them. And when you come out, it says, you remain separate. Wherefore, come out from among them and be ye separate, says the Lord. And touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. I will be a father unto you, and you shall be my sons and my daughters, says the Lord Almighty. I'm dividing the message tonight to three parts. Number one, the place of humility and unity in God's family. The place of unity, humility and unity in God's family. Number two, the power of holiness and unity in a gracious fellowship. The power of holiness and unity in a gracious fellowship. Number three, the passion for harvest and unity in a growing flock. The passion for harvest and unity in a growing flock. Number one, what's number one again? The place of humility and unity in God's family. I want you to write the word united, please. Or word united. I'm sure you know that U-N-I-T-E-D. United. Which is the letter there that refers to you? Again, I. I want you to move the position of that I and write another word and just sheet the position of that I forward. Instead of being behind T, put it in front of T. What word do you have? Again, you know, is the position of I, the place where I occupies that is that letter i that determines whether we're united or we're untied disunited you know if you come in and you, you're not satisfied with your place your position where the lord has put you in the body and you want to move from where you are just a little bit ahead of T, our togetherness. And our togetherness is not what's important to you. What's important to you is the place you occupy and the place where you are. You're going to disorganize everything. You're going to untie everything. You're going to dislocate and remove everything out of place. Because you want to control and you want to be the man there. Even when you are not the one that is doing the preaching. And you are not the one that is giving the word. The place you are and the place you stay and the place where you stand, that's not enough for you. You must relocate and move from this place and go to that other place. That's what brings us problems. But it's where you're willing to stay where you are. And you say, Lord, I'm all right. If we must spell the word right, the letter I must stay in its place. Once there's an ambition, the ambition of Absalom, and once there's a self-will, the self-will of Korah, Dathan, and Abiram, and once there's the dissatisfaction with who I am, with what I am, and where I am, you are going to bring this unity. That's why, as we look at this, we cannot talk about unity without humility. How are we going to reach that place 
And are we going to be united without you taking your place? That's why we're looking at the place, the position of humility and unity in God's family. We're looking at some 131, one, some 131. It says in verse 1, Lord, my heart is not haughty. I think if anybody had anything to be proud about in Israel, David had something to be proud about. And yet David said, oh Lord, you know my heart. My heart is not haughty. He did what others have not done in Israel. He conquered Goliath. And all the women in the nation sang about him. In fact, Saul made his own conclusion. He said, they have exalted him above me. They've given him 10,000 and me 1,000. There's nothing remaining. They're going to give him the throne. That David was appreciated by everybody in Israel and feared by everybody in Gaza, among the Philistines. And yet he said, my heart is not haughty. Mine eyes are not lofty. You see, it is the humility, the humility in each one, a leader, a preacher, an overseer, a member, a man, a woman, and the young people, everyone. is the humility that keeps us united together. Lord, my heart is not haughty, nor mine eyes lofty, neither do I exercise myself in great matters. Neither do I exercise myself in great matters. David, why are you talking like this? You wrote many of the Psalms. You are the singer of Israel. And when you play that harp, the evil spirit goes away from Saul and you. You are a mighty warrior. You are a king. You are a prophet. You are everything. And yet he said, I will not exercise myself in great matters. That's why he was united with the people. He would rather allow people to walk over him than to push people down, walk over them and say, I will get to where I will get to. I I don't care who is hurt. I don't care who is offended. I don't care who does not agree. I'm going to push everybody down and get to where I'm getting to. Isn't that the culture that we find ourselves in over here? That people just say, I'm going to have my way. He may feel offended. He may feel unhappy. He may feel hurt. I don't care. I must have my way, not David. You know, if we're going to have this fellowship we're talking about, it's not just a superficial thing. It's not just something written on paper. It's something very practical that you're willing to stay where you ought to stay. And then you're able to say, you're not just telling your fellow man your heart is not haughty. You're telling the almighty God himself, Lord my heart is not haughty, mine eyes not lofty, neither do I exercise myself in great matters or in things too high for me, or in things too high for me. Isn't that what disunites us and divides?